you are not anywhere close to being as productive as you want to be. And if you don't fix these mistakes in Notion, you'll waste hours every single week. But it's not as hard to fix these issues as you think. So if you're a beginner in Notion, or even if you've been using your setup for a while, by the end of this, you can 10x your productivity. So if you've ever wondered, why hasn't my productivity boosted since signing up to Notion? Well, you might have been misusing its capabilities entirely. Here's how to create an insanely efficient Notion setup to 10x your productivity. Have you ever sat down to work and realized you don't know where to start? Your brain is fried with all these to-do list notes that you should be doing. But where do you start? Do you write that assignment? Do you open up the dreaded inbox? Do you call back that missed call from that client? Do you clean the dishes? Or do you go rewatch The Office for the 10th time? Oh God, that is so disgusting. If you don't create a proper structure to your day, you'll always be at the mercy of whatever next notification comes up or whatever next idea you have. So the tip number one is to time block your day. Now that can be on paper, that can be in a Google calendar, or you can build it straight into your Notion, like my headquarters template. Basically, ensuring you're seeing all your to-dos as a list format, but also as a time block structure. So time blocking, time boxing, scheduling, whatever you want to call it, is basically just assigning a time that you'll do each task. That way you won't get distracted by each idea or task and wonder, should I be doing this now instead? Create your day schedule and stick to it. Day schedule. Speaking of having random ideas throughout the day, my brain is like a damn fire hose. The second my brain starts thinking up random ideas, whether it's video ideas, work stuff, fun activities or places to visit, my brain will not stop going for the next few hours. You think, oh, I'll just open up my travel notes and write in that I want to visit this cool restaurant that I saw on TikTok. Then when you're on that page, you realize, oh, it looks a bit messy. Maybe I should clean it up. And then you realize you haven't gotten the menus linked for quick access. So you think, you know what, I'll start to, you get the point. Every idea you have isn't actually a two second idea. It's now a distraction. I'm not saying these ideas are bad. Obviously you want to be coming up with good ideas and stuff, but I'm saying you need to rethink your idea capture system. Because if you don't fix it, you'll always be distracted by every idea you have for many minutes or often like me, many ideas get me going down rabbit holes for hours. And that's tip number two, create a button that adds ideas to relevant pages. Let me show you. Instead of opening up a local adventures page and being distracted and cognitively overloaded every time you open up this page, we'll create a button that adds your notes straight to that page. And that button will sit on your dashboard. That way you never leave your dashboard until you want to focus on that specific page. So this back and forth between pages is called context switching, and it is the enemy of progress. Your brain gets exhausted from context switching all day, so the more you can minimize context switching, the more energy you'll have throughout the day, and the more productive you can be. So a few years ago, I would wake up and go to the gym before going to work. Now, I really struggled with this to be honest. Back then, I was not a morning person, so waking up to go to the gym was a battle every single morning. Then I read a book called Atomic Habits by James Clear, and in the book he talks about how he put his shoes by the bed, so he could wake up, get dressed, and put his shoes on. His rule was he didn't have to run, but his thinking was that it was a tiny bit easier because he thinks, oh, I might as well go, I already have the shoes on. So I took this a step further, I slept with my gym clothes on. Everything was already packed the night before, so when I woke up, I would just put on my shoes and walk out. Why am I telling you this? Why are you saying this stuff? That's exactly the answer I wanted! Now, in business, there's this idea called bottleneck analysis. Basically, it's just a way of looking at business and trying to understand what bit of the business is holding you back. Now, whether you run a business or not, you should be conducting bottleneck analysis. The bottleneck for me going to the gym was all the prep in the morning when I'm tired. Now, pack all that stuff and find the gym clothes. That might not sound like a lot, but at 5.30 a.m. or whatever, you just want to keep sleeping. It's okay, birdie. So if you're not doing bottleneck analysis for your projects, then you could be missing out on so much productivity. Maybe you struggle working on your assignments. Well, how can you speed up the process to remove that struggle? Maybe it's that when you write assignments, you want lo-fi music playing, you want a coffee in your hand, and you want the right lighting in your room. Well, 
how can we make that setup time shorter? Maybe having a smart speaker that you say assignment time to, and then it dims the lights and it starts playing lo-fi music, and it turns on the coffee machine. Now that 15 minutes of prep time making the coffee, going on YouTube to look for a lo-fi playlist, and getting the lights just right, turned into a 5 second activity. So, how do you do bottleneck analysis? Well, create a database called bottlenecks and start writing down your struggles. It could be getting in the mood to study, could be uh, you don't have enough clients, could be you don't have the energy to work out. Whatever it is, write these down. And then you want to start with journaling about it. So why are we journaling here? Well, the more you can talk about this problem, the easier it will be to find a solution. Write down the whole scenario. Write down everything, whether it's big or small, that makes this a bottleneck in your life. Then when you've journaled, write down the tasks that you need to do in order to address these. It should be easier to write down the tasks as you've journaled. Journaling will help you uncover a bunch of stuff you weren't thinking about before. Your productivity will soar once you start removing more and more bottlenecks in your life so you can focus on actually moving the needle. Now, let's say you create a bunch of tasks, right? And you tick them off. A few weeks go by and you realize, wait, I've actually been going to the gym twice as much as I used to. Wait, what happened? Which of these tasks actually helped? Well, spending the time to dissect your tasks that you did this month is even more helpful. So what do you do? You'll want to go back and look at the tasks you've completed this month. And now you'll want to have a property called Move the Needle. Move the Needle is just a fancy way of saying for a task or project that significantly had an impact on your life. It made a big change to progress you in the direction that you want to go. So you go back and you see, wait, that one cold email that I sent to that company I want to work for landed me a job interview. You might not have got on the job, for example, but you got an interview. Well, that one task actually really helped you progress on your journey. Rewriting your resume for the fifth time this month maybe didn't help. Writing a new LinkedIn bio maybe didn't help. Writing that blog post that got two views maybe didn't help. But when you sent that cold email to that company saying why you'd like to work for them and how you can help, you got your foot in the door. Well, this is all hypothetical, by the way. But looking back on your past month's tasks and labeling the tasks that moved the needle will be useful for two reasons. You can see how much of what you do is actually important and having an impact. And you'll find patterns on the important tasks you should be doing more of. Let's say that one cold email to Tesla uh, got a meeting. Well, go send a similar email to all the competitors. Clearly you did something that worked. Use that email structure and send it to Honda, to Kia, to Ferrari, and to whatever new company is getting into car manufacturing. Now, from this reflection of tasks that move the needle, you know where to focus your effort. You'll stop writing these blogs that no one reads and instead spend time doing those cold emails. Obviously, this is an example. In your case, maybe no one responds to your cold emails, but you find your blogs have gotten people to reach out to you and want to work with you. What I'm saying is, this is hyper-specific to you. No YouTube video, no person, no guru is going to tell you what works and what doesn't. You need to assess the previous tasks you've done, and you'll know where to put more time and energy into once you know which tasks actually moved the needle and had an impact. If someone tells you, you need to do more of X, if you see in your database, actually, that hasn't gotten me any results, then maybe it's not right for you. Or if someone says, don't bother doing Y, but for you, you see in your task database that was actually successful a lot of the times you did it, then maybe it is right for you and not for them. These blanket statements of what works and what doesn't are really difficult to know when to ignore them and when to take them on board. However, if you have a list of every time you did that activity and you track if it was helpful or not, then you can use your own previous data to choose whether or not to take that advice on board. Now, to turn this move the needle exercise and bottleneck analysis from a one-off activity to a habit that you do every week, then I recommend clicking the second brain walkthrough video here as you can see how I've integrated it into my life.